I want to want to pray for us, and then we will enter a time of worship. If you're singing, if you haven't been with us before, if it's been a little while, that the kids are in the service for the first couple of songs. We do that intentionally. Um, but then after the second song, before the sermon, those kindergarten and down will head down this hallway for child care. And our first through fifth graders have a class every other week. This week, elementary kids, you do have a class. So you'll meet by the front doors um, to head across the street. Um, but let me, let me pray for us, and we will worship their song together. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that you are doing far more than we're aware of. So, Father, as we come in this morning, um, knowing, Lord, whether our week has been tremendous or it's been difficult, whether it's been mundane, and Father, whether we feel um, anxious this morning or our minds are already running about all the things that haven't been done or need to be done in the week ahead, Lord, would you just allow us to breathe deep? To rest, to be reminded that, that you haven't asked us to, to be in control of everything. God, that it's to trust that you are. To trust that you are faithful and that you see us and that you know us and that you love us. And Lord, would we um, be able to breathe and to respond and to hear from you this morning, Lord, because you're alive. And Lord, that we would then leave this place with worship continuing. Um, in the way that we interact at work, in the way that we handle our relationships, in the way that we spend our money, in the way that we make decisions this week, that we would be reminded that that is worship, um, just as rich and as deep as the songs that we sing this morning. God, in all of our life, we want to honor you. Would you speak? Would you move? Um, and would you give us courage to respond? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
Bible, if you have a Bible with you or a, a smartphone, some device, you'll be looking at the scriptures with us. Um, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Um, Ecclesiastes, you'll find it kind of nestled past Psalms and Proverbs to the right as you get to Isaiah or Jeremiah. It's not a little bit too far. Um, as you're looking or turning, um, and the, the scripture will be on the screen behind us as well. Um, Ecclesiastes is a, is a book of wisdom. Um, it's an old book from the Old Testament. And it, it really, what it's trying to focus on um, is what does life look like um, under the sun, right? Like if we look at life apart from someone who is following Jesus, how do they look at and navigate the world? I mean, then the impact that that has. And so it hits on the exceptions. It doesn't hit on the rule of life. It hits on the exception and says, hey, you can do the right things and and, and the race, right, as it says, the race doesn't always go to the swift, right? Like that there are exceptions in life that hit us and can knock us down. And so we have walked through this book. It, it has felt um, dark. It's felt pessimistic. But it's also felt really honest. It feels like the human experience. And so we are near the end. We've just got a couple chapters left. And, and here's ultimately what Ecclesiastes is asking us to do. If we were going to kind of sum it up. Here's what it's going to do. It's going to say, if you could fast forward to the end of your life and stand and watch and see um, the certainty that you're going to die. Right? If, if you could fast forward, not that you're trying to figure out how it happens or when it happens or how old, but if you could just fast forward and go, listen, there's going to be a day where I'm not the one attending the funeral. People are attending mine. Right? Like if you're willing to go there and say, hey, there's a certainty that that's going to happen. Either Jesus is going to split the sky and return for us, or there will be a day where you will be dead. It's, it's, just, it's just inevitable. It's going to happen. So, so if we can recognize that certainty, and, and listen, tragedy and, and the loss of loved ones, it helps us. We can do it kind of momentarily. We can go, okay, I can kind of picture that. Ecclesiastes is saying, go to that moment. And then rewind back to where you're at and now live in light of the fact that that certainty is going to happen. Here's the issue. We live in a culture that wants to talk about um, youth and about um, beauty. And we don't really like to talk about old age. And, and so even if we put someone sometimes older, right, we're often talking about, look how young they look. Right? Like everything's about, hey, death isn't coming for you. Right? We're going to live forever is, is what commercials want to... What, what, what commercials want to put a point us to as they're selling their products so we can avoid death, don't think about death, don't talk about death. We're a culture who has attempted to kind of remove death from the, the, the conversation. And so if you're really going to be willing this morning to consider the fact that you're going to die, it's probably going to do a couple things. If, if you're willing to even consider it at all, it might paralyze you. Right? Like just kind of go, I don't, I don't know how to act with that. I don't know how to interact with that. I, and it just kind of freezes you. And right, it may be that you would say, I'm just going to kind of bury my head in the sand, pretend like we're not having this conversation, and just go on with my life. Some would say, well, okay, if it's a certainty, then let's eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die. Right? And, and you just kind of say, I'm going to become numb, and I'm going to be foolish, but I can't stop it anyway. And so you kind of go towards hedonism. Right? Others would say, you know what, I'm going to fight against it. And so you're going to become um, super health conscious. You're going to be thinking about your diet and exercise and medicine and, and, supple and all these things going, I'm going to hold it off as long as I can. And, and you're not really even embracing the fact that it's inevitable. It's going to happen regardless. Right? Like there's many ways that we can kind of fight against it. But what Ecclesiastes is really going to ask us to do is to live in light of it. It's going to say, no, no, no. Actually, I want you to embrace it's going to happen. And now let's figure out how we live knowing that that's where this thing ends. Because in the end, it's not life, death, and it's over. It's life, it's death, and then we stand before God. Hebrews 9, 27, right, tells us it's appointed unto man but once to die, and then judgment. If we look at verse 10 of chapter 11, um, we'll read it in a moment, but it says, or sorry, verse, verse 9. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. There is life, there is death, and then we stand before God. And, and so if we know that the inevitable is going to happen, how do we live in life of this? Let me, let me see if I can illustrate it before we read chapter 11. 
Now, for those of you, um, if you maybe have nightmares still about college or about high school, like you wake up and you've forgotten to go to a class all semester, right? Uh, does anybody else have that nightmare? I, I have that one. Um, and I, I realize it's finals week and I haven't gone to class. I've just forgotten the whole semester. Listen, um, a, a college professor hands you most often a syllabus the first day of class and tells you, hey, this is what the semester is going to look like. Here's all the things that are going to happen. And on this day, you're going to have a final, like a final project or a final test. That's your reality. But man, it feels a long way off, right? It's not that close. And so people take different approaches to get to that final. Some go, I'll get to it when I get to it. Right? That's December. It's September. we got plenty of time. Right? And they just kind of put it off. There'll, there'll, there'll be more time. Others have really good intentions. Like every day they're like, okay, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to study. I'm going to read. I'm going to, I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to do really good this semester. And then every day you get up and you think that. Right? Every day you get up and you say that. And your good intentions, all of a sudden it's December. And you're like, oh, I think I've studied twice. Right? Like, I've done it a couple times. There are a few of you who would go to class, you're going to go to tutoring, you're going to take advantage of all the tools and all the things that, that have been um, offered to you. You're going to study a little bit daily, and it just kind of adds up. And so the night before the final, one of two things happens. You're either in panic mode and pulling an all-nighter because you just haven't done what was necessary through the semester. Right? And so it's, it's your, you're drinking coffee, you're staying up late. You're, you're freaking out. And for others, they're like, hey, it's just another test. It's another day. Why? Because they just kind of work on it day by day by day. They live in light of the reality that the teacher wasn't lying. Then on December the 11th, there's going to be a test. And they've lived in light of it. And so they're prepared. And they just walk in and, and they take it. While others are going, oh my gosh, how did we not know this was coming? Well, you did. Right? You just chose to ignore it and not live in light of it. Ecclesiastes is saying, hey, there's a final you might want to live in light of it. You might want to have a mind towards it. And yet we can fall into the same traps of like, hey, we have good intentions. We're going to get to that. We mean to. And then tragedy strikes. And we're reminded often in the life of someone else or someone that we love or care for. Oh, it's coming. But how are we going to live? And so let's look at Ecclesiastes 11 beginning in verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not, will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and in evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Life is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart, put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Okay, now listen, I understand that, that there, it is, chapter 11 is very po po poetic, it's proverbial. You're probably going, hey, nothing that you started the sermon with appeared in Ecclesiastes 11. Right? Like, Ecclesiastes 11 can just kind of feel like, the rambling nonsense of someone, right? Like, have no idea. Why are we talking about soggy bread? You know? Um, but let, let's walk through and see if, if we can't make these connections this morning. Ultimately, what verses 1 and 2 are going to begin to show us is that we shouldn't be paralyzed. We are supposed to live and act, but there's some things we need to recognize. The first being this. There is risk in life, right? Like, live and act and do, but know there's risk. And so verses 1 and 2... Are proverbial, right? It says, cast your bread upon the waters, and you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you don't know what disaster may happen on earth. 
what it's saying is this, is you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the future. And, and so the idea behind this was you would send a business venture, you would put your bread on a boat, maritime trade, right? And you don't know if a storm's going to destroy that boat, if it's going to come back, if it's going to bring profit, if you're going to have loss, if you're going to lose it all. Um, it, it's the imagery of like just soggy bread. Is if you're throwing your bread in water, what do you know has happened to it? It's ruined. Right? And so there is risk in putting your bread in the water. There's risk in venture. There's risk in business. There's risk in life. And you don't know what's going to happen. And so, but don't be paralyzed by it. Don't not take action. Don't not live. It says you don't know the future. There may be a return. Maybe not. But still be generous. Still be active. Still act. Cast your bread upon the waters and you'll find it after many days. Not knowing the future is not a reason for us to stand paralyzed and not do anything. We'll see this begin to come together and make maybe more sense here in a moment. Verse 3. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. What, what he's saying here is, listen, there's an the inevitability to the world, right? You see a cloud full of rain, it's going to rain. Now listen, in, in West Texas, we don't believe this, right? <laughs> We're like, Solomon, you may be wrong here. But what he's simply trying to remind us is there's some rhythms to the world. There's just some things that are inevitable. They're going to happen. There's, there's, there's rhythm to them. But there's also randomness in the world. And so he says, so if a tree falls to the south and to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. He's saying, right, the, the tree's not asking your permission as to where it's going to fall. Right? You, you watch the old Mayhem commercials, right? And the tree falls in the, in the, in the bedroom, right? Like, or it falls and crushes a car. Like it's not going, hey, where would it be most convenient for you if in the storm tonight if I fall? How can I miss your car in your house? It falls. There's a randomness to life as well. And so he's saying, listen, we don't know the future. There's some things that inevitably are going to happen. There's some things that are random that we cannot prepare for. Right? We lack control. And so even though this language is, is kind of strange and it feels foreign to us, ultimately what he's trying to do is saying, do you understand you're not in control? You can see the cloud full of rain and you can't make it rain. You can see the cloud full of rain and you can't stop it from raining. You can't tell the tree where to fall when it falls in the storm. You can send your, your business ventures out and hope and set up for, for success and failure can still come. Because you just don't know the future. He continues. Verse 4. He who observes the wind will not sow. And so you say the one who sees that it's windy outside decides not to plant. The one who sees the clouds and thinks it might be a storm isn't going to reap. Here's what he's saying in, in proverbial style. There is no perfect time to do anything. There is always a reason not to do something. So he says, if the farmer sits and goes, oh, it's a little windy, he's never going to plant, right? Especially if he's in the panhandle, <laughs> right? If you, if you look up and you say, oh, it might be stormy, we shouldn't harvest. You're never going to harvest. He's saying there's no perfect time. We, we get this in, in agriculture, right? But there's, there's no perfect time to have kids, right? There's no perfect time to get married. There's no perfect time to have um, a new business venture. Listen, in all of those things, there, there are better times. There is wisdom in when we do it or when we might not do it. But if you're waiting for everything to line up and say, this, we have the amount of money that we want, we have the house that we want, we have all the things that we need, now it's time for children. You will never have kids. Ever. Right? You'll never get married. You'll never do anything. And so he's saying, I want you to act. I don't want you to be paralyzed. And if you're waiting on perfection, if you're waiting on the guarantee that failure cannot happen, you will not do anything, and your life will pass you by. He's saying we still have to act even though we're not in control, even though, even though there's some randomness, even though there's some inevitable things that will happen, even though we cannot guarantee success or failure, continue to live, continue to move forward. Listen, last January, we, we helped Ricky and his team and Warner plant a church in January of 2021. A pandemic, 
Right? Like, no one's going to go, hey, you know the best time to start a new church would be when no one's wanting to go to church. Right? Because they're afraid of being sick. Right? Like, that doesn't seem... But, but when would be the right time? Right? So if you... Well, the school's starting. Well, it's summer. Right? Well, it's cold. Well, everyone's on vacation. Right? There's, you can make it a reason for why we would never do it ever. And so he's saying, you do it. You prepare, you pray, you ask, and then you move forward. Verse 5. You don't know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. So you don't know the work of God who makes everything. Here's maybe one of the hardest ones for us, right? But you're not going to get all the answers. You're not going to know all the reasons. You're not going to know all the things. And, and you can raise an angry fist at God and demand some answers. And he does not feel obliged to answer you. Now we want to, right? We want him to. We want to think that if we throw a big enough fit, that he'll give us what we're asking for. But he's saying... Hey, you, you don't even understand exactly how cells are multiplying and, and, and doing these things that where the bones and like all these things are happening in the womb. You would love to understand it more. He's like, but God does it. Right? In, in John 3, we, we hear Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He says, the spirit is like the wind. You see the effect of it. You can feel it, but you can't see it. You don't know where it's going. You can't grab it. There are just some things that are moving through the world that God is doing, and you see the effect of it, you see the benefit of it, you see the, the difficulty in it, but you can't stop it, grab it, harness it, or do anything about it. There are just some things that are not knowable. Listen, in Job chapter 38, Job um, has, wants to have a conversation with God. He's got some opinions. And there's a conversation that is recorded in chapter 38. If you want to read 38 and 39, all of it, you can see um, some interesting conversation. But I'm just going to read a couple for you. God speaking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases so... Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? I prescribed limits for it. I set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Then in verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Uh, verse 35, can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Right? Like God's just saying, hey, there's some things, like you think you want to have a conversation as equals. We're not equals. Right? I'm in control. I'm sovereign. I'm good. I've done it. And you have some opinions and you have some thoughts. And if you want to raise an angry fist, Go ahead, but I have some questions for you. Where were you? Right? I, you're assuming that you can handle all the understanding and all the answers, right? And so the question Ecclesiastes is asking is who's the fool? Right? Who's the fool? Who's, is it the one that would raise an angry fist and say, God, I demand for you to help me understand everything that there is to know in the world? Or the one who embraces its limits? He says, God, I trust your character. Right? It doesn't mean that we turn our brains off. It doesn't mean that we don't seek for understanding or for knowledge, but that we understand who we are and who he is. And he's not just a slightly better version of us. He is God, and we are not. It's, it's not much different than a, a, a child asking their parent to explain something that the child's not ready for. And the, and the response would be, trust me. What are you asking them to trust? Your character, right? That, that you're not keeping things from them, that you're good, that you're for them, that you're going to help them. You'll help them understand. You're going to take care of them. God is saying, know your place. Know your place. Verse 6. In the morning, sow your seed, and at evening, withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. 
Again, it's a reminder not to be inactive. He's not saying throw up your hands and be paralyzed, but continue to live, continue to act. He, he uses this farming illustration again. It's like plant the seed, check the harvest, do the thing, have a backup as, as a means for all of life in the way that we live and act and do. So just one example of this would be the way that we would pursue ministry. Listen, we don't know whose marriage is going to be restored. We don't know whose addiction is going to be broken. We don't know who's going to live, leave a life of living for themselves and trust God to become right a faithful follower of Jesus. We don't know. And so what do we do? We plant the seed in all of it. And then we trust what we cannot control, that the Spirit of God will do what only the Spirit of God will do. That he will rescue and he will restore and he will redeem and he will reconcile. And sometimes we are certain we know who he's going to do it for and it doesn't happen. And other times we're thinking that once that person's far too gone. And then they become a brother or sister in the Lord and walk with Jesus for decades. Right? But we cannot begin to understand. And so Paul will write in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Verse 2, so preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. He says, just do it. I just tell people. Encourage them. Walk with them. Be um, active in ministry at all times with all peoples because you're not in control of the outcome. Right? God is. This is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. So the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So we do life, we do ministry bountifully, trusting that God will bring about a harvest. Just as a farmer doesn't throw one seed down and hope for a field full, right? He sows generously, bountifully, hoping that the Lord would, would bring back a harvest. So we do in ministry as we pursue people. So, these first six verses are telling us this. Listen, don't be paralyzed. Live your life. Do your life. Know there's risk. Know you don't know the future. Know you're not in control. Know there'll be some inevitable things. There'll be some random things. There's no perfect time to do anything. You're not going to know it all. <coughs> but act and live. I do it. And the way that we're going to be able to do this is by embracing our limits, accepting the terms that have been offered, that we're not in control, that we won't get everything answered. And Ecclesiastes is the reminder that there are exceptions for all of it, for all of it. So let's let's continue. Because what what we want us to kind of begin to wrap up Ecclesiastes is this, is that all of life actually has meaning. It's not that all of life is vain, that we can't grab a hold of it. It's that we put significance and meaning in the wrong places. And God is saying, if you put it in me, all of life will have meaning. If we understand that there will be a day when we stand before God, that now we can live in the reality of life. Life can be both beautiful and painful. Both of those can be true because there will be a day where we will stand before God. So, we have jobs, right? And if we look for meaning in our jobs, if we look for soul satisfaction in your job, you won't be found wanting. You won't find it. But our jobs can have meaning. Right? Because they provide a source of enjoyment, a source of good. They provide the ability for us to provide for, for our family, for ourselves, for our friends. Um, it's an opportunity to maybe do what it is that you love. An opportunity for you to honor God by working, whether you have a good boss or a bad boss, you work to honor the Lord. It allows you an opportunity to image the character of God in the midst of both believers and unbelievers. Right, so if your job is your ultimate source of satisfaction, it will be vapor and you won't be able to ever grasp it. It will be found wanting. But if we see that our ultimately we're honoring God, our job is simply one means in this life that we have to do that. Whether it's at home or in the workplace, 
Whether we have a good work situation or a bad work situation, a good boss or a horrible boss, there are things that we can do that would honor the Lord. And it begins to bring meaning because we're, we're pleasing Him. Listen, Carmen loves to plant flowers. And early in our marriage, I would ask the question, why? Like, I, they, they get wind whips, right? They die every year. Um, we, we, like, why? Like, why spend the money to do this when you know in three or four months they're all going to be dead? And I, I mean, I, I legitimately like, was like, it just feels like a waste. And it was honestly, it was understanding that there's meaning in beauty, right? Like that God has given us beauty in this world to make our hearts long for more. To see that the kingdom of God will be a place of perfection. That he placed Adam and Eve in a garden, right? That was beautiful, that had everything that they needed. That there is value because it reminds us that, right, that we're fighting against that this world isn't what it's supposed to be. And so we can make big Right, like we can push and pursue after people. Right, we can make um, institutional stands, and we can plant flowers. Right, then in all of these ways, we're saying this isn't what it's meant to be. There's more, and beauty is part of it, and joy is part of it, and, and satisfaction is part of it. And so we can make small gains and small victories. Right, and we can bring beauty and hope and joy in the world because we're ultimately not saying that that is what satisfies. It's that there is one in Jesus who does. And these are ways that remind our hearts that he is more, that he is sufficient, and that he provides meaning. So we pursue people, right? Because life has inherent value because we're created by God. And because we've been pursued by him. That we parent, right? Not to find our, our, our identity or our value completely in that because we get to love and to cherish and to enjoy relationships and we disciple and we discipline because we've been disciplined ourselves right by a loving parent that in all of these things if we look for any of them our marriage our parenting our job our bank account our power our pleasure our value to be in those things or some combination of those things it will be found wanting and you will not be able to grasp the smoke of this life but if in all of those you can be honoring and serving King Jesus and seeing the way that he has given these things to us for satisfaction, for good, for joy, to ultimately be found completely and fully in him, then all of life has meaning. Whether it is beautiful or whether it is difficult, whether it's hard or whether it's good, we can be honest. We don't have to be Pollyanna. We can say, it's hard right now. But the Lord is faithful. He has not left me. We can say it's good right now, but it's not sufficient because Jesus is. Listen to how he, he words this. Light is sweet, in verse 7, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. You just kind of see him extolling life. Like, there are things that we can just be exuberant about. Life is good. We can enjoy it. Enjoy it. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many, and all that comes is vanity. So he's saying, listen, enjoy your life, and also know there are seasons, and some of them will be painful and be difficult, and that your death is coming. And it might feel counterintuitive, but he's saying if we can live in light of that, then we can enjoy the days, the weeks, the months, the years, the decades prior to it. If we understand it's coming. Because he says if we try to hold on to something that we can't hold on to, our youth, our vitality, time, then we will find that it's transient and it will run from us. Listen to verse 10. Remove vexation. It's another word for frustration from your heart. Put away pain from your body. For you and the dawn of life are vanity. He's saying like we can't hold on to them. And if you try to hold on to them, you don't enjoy them while you have them. So rejoice, young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Enjoy your life. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. He's simply saying, in the way that we live our life, the way that we spend our money, the way that we make decisions, 
the way that we follow Jesus, the way that we interact with our neighbor, all in all of life, we will someday stand before God. And we will give an answer for the way that we live. So we say, let there be some weight and gravitas to life. Right? Do life, live it, but know that you will give account for it. So you can be honest when life is hard. You can be honest when life is good and enjoy it. Time is going to continue to march on. And when we're young, we assume it will last forever. It won't. And the older you get, the quicker you know that. And the quicker it feels like it's moving on. Think about it in this regard. Often young folks will say, like they'll hear an older person, maybe their grandparent or aunt and uncle say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Right? And if you remember being young and hearing that, you'd be like, hey, shut up. Like, what are you saying? I don't want Jesus to come quickly. Like, I want to enjoy my life. I want to live my life. I want to do this thing. Like, I get that you're old, but stop it. Right? I, I remember feeling that. Now I understand more why someone would say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Because they've seen the world. And they've seen difficulty. And they've seen tragedy. And they've seen pain. And they've seen these things. They're like, oh, but Jesus is going to restore it. And that is good news. And that is hope. So come quickly, Lord Jesus. A young person goes, no, no, I got, I got years ahead of me. Let me enjoy this thing for a while. Right? He's, he's really saying, listen, there are going to be days that where you're saying, I just want to rejoice in them. And there are going to be days of darkness. Right? Both will be a part of your life. There will be seasons that are difficult, seasons that are good. It's why when we stand before and do a marriage, right, the vows are this, in good times and in bad sickness and in health, in riches and in poverty, because you don't know. You don't know what your life holds. You're not in control. And so for some, it is good, and you're saying, I want to do it with you. For some, it's difficult, and you're saying, I want to do it with you. And for some, it's, and for most, it's a mixture of both. And you're saying, but I choose to do it with you. God is saying, listen, you're not alone in this life. He's calling us to trust him this morning. Because the promise of scripture is this. It's not that when you know Jesus, that your life is smooth sailing and that your bread always comes back. To say that you're not alone. That he'll never leave us and he will never forsake us. That he has left his spirit as a down payment, as a, a sign and a marker. And he is going to keep all of his promises and that he's returning for us. And that when death comes for the one who's in Jesus... Death means our faith becomes sight. His death has been defeated. Our final enemy has been destroyed. And so we don't have to fear it. We can live in light of it. We can trust his good character that he's with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. That he hears you and he sees you and he cares about you. That he's given you access to him through his church, through his spirit, through his word, through prayer. He's also told us there will be trouble. In John 16, there will be trouble. I'm with you, and I've overcome the trouble. And he's given us one another. Church, if we can understand that God is for us, that he is with us, and that we are safe and secure in his hand because of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, then we can live in life of our death. Right? Knowing that we don't have to know tomorrow. We don't have to know the circumstances that we won't be alone. And that those things, those difficulties, don't get the final say Jesus does. And that one day we'll stand before him. And you may have been the one that walked with him for the totality of your life, doing the God working and preparing for those finals day in and day out. And in that moment, it will not be your effort or your work that satisfies God. It will be the fact that Jesus' righteousness covers you. And you may be the one right now panicking, saying, I, I forgot we had a class. Um, and I have blown it for the entire semester. I have nothing. I don't even know what class actually it is. And Jesus this morning says, I've, I've accomplished it for you. I've lived the life you're supposed to live. I've died the death that you deserve. I have beaten sin, Satan, and death. And I stand alive today. Receive my grace. Receive my mercy. Know that I'm... I can be yours and you can be mine and I will cover you. And when you stand in judgment, it will not be judgment. 
it will be done to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you trust in me and you walk with me through life. and it's Jesus or it's nothing. You stand covered in Christ before God in judgment someday, or you stand and you will stand in judgment. There's, there's no bell curve, right? There's no laws better than some. We're either covered by the blood of Jesus or we stand alone and we will face judgment alone. This morning, would we let the strange language of Ecclesiastes 11. Remind us that there are some things that we can just kind of see in this life that we can't, we're not in control. We can't figure it all out. We won't know everything. But actually all of life can have meaning because we can honor Jesus in all of it. Right? And so we want to then spend the rest of our life figuring out how to do that, parsing that out. And seeing that he is worth it, that he actually does satisfy our souls, that he is sufficient for us. And then pray for us. Father, would you allow the, the exceptions of, of life, the, the times where we planted double the, the seed and got no harvest. God, when we've had failure, when we've had success, Lord, would you let all the circumstances and situations of life, God, point us to, and, and turn our chins to see you. God, that you are faithful, that you are sufficient. God, where our life is devoid and lacking meaning, that we can find it in you. God, where we have put too much meaning in lesser things. God, that those will continue to crumble around us and be vapor in our hands. And Lord, but in you, when, when we put our hope in our in our, our satisfaction in you, that we can then enjoy the things of life. The finer things and the smaller things and the ordinary things. Because we put the weight where it belongs and it's on you. God, this morning, would you reveal in our hearts where we're putting our satisfaction? God, whether it's in you or it's in something else. Lord, would you draw us to trust in you? God, would you give us the courage to consider the day of our death and to live in light of that? Not out of fear, not paralyzed, but trust that we're secure in your hands. So we ask you to speak, to work, to move for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name.
So wherever you are this morning, if you're struggling because things are not going to plan, or if things have gone well and you're like, ah, this is not enough, let me just direct you to Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, God is orchestrating circumstances that you might be forced to seek him and find that he is the best thing that you could ever, ever, ever enjoy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good, and we thank you for your patience and your grace and your work. We thank you that you have um, arranged circumstances that we might seek you and find you. Lord, would you only give us humility? Would you direct us to you that we might find exactly what we're looking for? Amen. Amen. 